Thank you all for coming here today. Thank you for coming to Coffee House number 163. <laughs> <laughs> this coffee house is a little bit a stretch for us because it's not directly related to theater, but theater was part of the community and it took pictures of everybody downtown. <laughs> so I think it's time to extend it. <laughs> uh, and if we talk about community, um, we just lost um, three days ago a very special person. Yeah. We lost Barbara, my sister, and she was here two weeks ago. Yeah. Um, she was attacked nine days ago in front of her house, in front of her building. Um, and she passed away on the four days ago. Um, the last coffee house we had before the pandemic hit was Barbara. Barbara was a special person, a unique person. I can't even imagine a life without her. Um, and it's very important that we dedicate and remember her today. Actually, we're going to stream her coffee house soon. Um, uh, the woman who attacked her is still on the loose and her picture is being shown every half an hour. And we have one. So if you know anything, please. Um, as you can see, this um, coffee house is happening each time on a set of a different show. This is a set of um, the show that called um, Lemon Girls by Talking Band, which is highly, highly recommended. And if you come today, there's a ton, $10, I think, discount. If you say um, Saturday 10. Anyway, it runs till um, March 27. And I really, really recommend it. Anyway, um, we can start now. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Um, oh, if I do this, I can see people. It's really great. <laughs> wonderful. It is wonderful to see you all here. I might take my hand down. I won't see you anymore. But anyway. Um, I, my name is Stephen Koch, and I am the director of the Archive of Peter Hujar, and have been for the last 35 years. Um, and uh, I'm particularly grateful to have a really thrilling audience like this to talk to tonight, because um, it's a very live wire. I want to leave special time, extra time, for the Q&A. Uh, and I'd like to begin, before I introduce our panel, with a slight confession. It's followed by a little bit of a story, and then a happy Please ending. use the mic. Oh, sorry, yes? No, good. OK, now, is this working? Yeah. OK. I'm not going to repeat all that stuff. <laughs> okay. So, uh, a few years before he died, Peter and I were together, as we were many, many times. And he was talking to me, and he mentioned Lisette Modell. And I said to him, who is Lisette Modell? And he looked at me with blank shock. Obviously considering whether the friendship was going to last for the next five minutes. And then he said, Lisette Modell is a photographer, and Lisette Modell is one of the greats. That phrase stuck in my mind, one of the greats. And I said, I don't know anything about it. He said, oh, yes, you do. And he then started naming Modell's pictures, which were already inscribed in my imagination without her name being there. And I learned something about photography that day. But I also learned something about the word great. When I got my job as the director of Peter's Archive, I think it's possible that nobody on Peter's Rolodex, remember Rolodexes? Yeah. <laughs> nobody on Peter's Rolodex knew less about the fine art of photography than me. Certainly much less than anybody on this panel. And people were a little miffed about that. But I knew certain things for sure. I knew that he was an important photographer. I knew that his work was significant. 
I knew that I had a big responsibility. I knew that it was going to need to be taken from relative obscurity into visibility. And I knew he was one of the, if not the most interesting person I'd ever known. But I was limited in my understanding of his work. That's what the convention is. I didn't really get it. I thought, for example, Peter is a difficult photographer. It's hard for people to understand him. It takes work to get past the kind of scream in front of the work that's difficult to penetrate. That didn't matter. I knew that it was important work, and I did my best by it. Several years into what I was doing, as things were beginning to take a little bit of movement toward Peter coming out of obscurity, and it was every day working on this, a curator, Joel Smith, now the curator of photography at the Morgan Library, was then the curator of photography at the Princeton University Library, a uh, museum, excuse me, and he said, to me one day, would you like to see our collection of huge arts? And I didn't even know that there was a Princeton collection of huge arts, but there were 20 of them. And he said, come out, I'll set them up and we'll show them to you. And I was delighted, got on the train and took the dinky, came over to the museum and was greeted by Joel, who led me to a room that was maybe 20 by 20, something like that, all white with racks. And he had set up 20 of those pictures with the curator's incredible intelligence. He's a very smart guy. And I walked in, and I was speechless. I thought, what have I gotten into? What is going on here? I was absolutely overwhelmed by the beauty of that room and the extraordinary work that was laid out there. I finally, after years of involvement with Peter's work, got it right square in the face. It was so magnificent. It was one of the most important artistic experiences of my entire life. And I will never get past it, and I will always be grateful that it happened, and I know that it took a while to get there. But nonetheless, one of the greats, as I was trying to promote Peter's work, I was always very careful. Don't talk about him as a great photographer. Don't say great. People who just think that you're bullshitting him. Stop. Just hold back a little bit. Don't overdo it. Then, with the Morgan Library show, Three of the principal critics of photography in this country referred to him as a great photographer. I therefore have to say, Peter Hugart is one of the greats. Yeah. Oh, wait. Uh, I think that we're going to begin. Let me introduce the panel first, and then we've got a short film clip of Ethel Eichelberger talking about Peter. But first, Moira Davy, uh, a photographer whose book, The Shabbiness of Beauty, right here, is a collaboration of her aesthetic and her personality with Peter's work, and a very remarkable piece of work that it is. Next, Nan Golden. Some of you may be interested in know she doesn't, who she is. Um, <laughs> She's not unknown. The fact is that she's probably one of the most eminent and impressive and important photographers now working. Yes. Anyway. Yes. Hey. And she was a dear friend of Peter's. Gary Schneider. In his own right, Gary is a photographer who is as radical and original as anybody I can think of. And at the same time, he is one of the most impressive and important critters of photographer anywhere in the world right now. And by great good fortune, he was guided into his métier 
by Peter himself in a major relationship. If any of you are interested in getting a really intimate understanding of Peter and his work and how he went about it, just go to Magic Hour Photography interview with Gary Schneider, which is there right now. And one of the very special interviews I've ever heard. It's very good. Next, Vince Aletti. There were about 20 people who believed that Peter was their best friend. <laughs> 200. It was, yeah, right. it was incredible. I thought, well, he's my best friend. <laughs> That's all there is to it. I'm his best friend. It's obvious. Uh, then I realized I was standing at the end of a very long line. But at the head of the line was the real best friend, which is Insulet. Now the, the the photography critic of the New Yorker magazine. So, should we take a look at this clip of uh, Ethel Hedgehog? Is that workable right now? of the portraits of 
people lying down or reclining, and then the second part, um, maybe ten prints from the um, uh, from the catacombs in, in Palermo, and um, actually, you know, uh, just to sort of directly answer your question about like one of the ways that um, his work impacted me, I was um, in 2008. I was editing a video. I had a grant in a studio in Paris for ten months, and I was I was shooting video in all the different Paris cemeteries, the big ones, the little ones. Um, I was going to the catacombs. Um, I had this text. I was I, I had a grant to make a video, and I was trying to make a video from this text that I'd written and chaining myself to my keyboard, you know, day in and day out, nothing was happening. And then one day, kind of just like uh, Deus Ex Machina, I remembered who John's book, Portraits in Life and Death, and that and it gave me the idea for how to structure this video to have it be in two parts. The first were portraits of people commenting on a passage uh, of a, a letter that Walter Benjamin wrote, and then the second part were all these portraits of, of the cemeteries. So that, I can say more, but maybe I'll pass. To... I was one of the people who thought Peter was my best friend. <laughs> Um, and yeah, I was in love with him. I think most people in the 80s, Dante New York, were in love with Peter. He was so charming and so beautiful and so seductive. We used to call him the human ballad. <laughs> <laughs> and his work had an enormous impact on me, but it took time because my work was from the act of living, and his work is so deep and so still, and he stills time, but he shows the depths. And after I really started to understand his work, I wanted to be him. And so there was a period, and he, he was a big fan of my early black and white work from Boston in the 70s. And so at one point we tried to do each other's work, and it failed miserably. <laughs> I don't have that kind of aesthetic, and and stillness and ability to frame. He taught me to love photography. I thought photography was a lesser art, and I was always on my way to be a filmmaker. I was just passing through photography. And uh, maybe uh, someday I'll still be a filmmaker. But um, he taught me to love the medium. He taught me to respect it. There was, he was the greatest portraitist of the 20th century. In line with Julia Margaret Cameron, I think. I think he's a direct descendant of her, of Lizette. But he took, I, I don't think anyone else could look as deeply as Peter could look at people. And he wasn't, and he showed all the different stages of life, from babies to death. And he wasn't really afraid of death in his work. I'll let, I'll pass. I have more, but we can get back. <coughs> Um, I was also my, I was also Peter's best friend. So <laughs> <laughs> definitely was my best friend. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, he uh, he totally changed my life. I met him in '77, and uh, he saw that I could see photography. He got me a job in a photo lab, and he saw that I could also print. And then he made me open a lab. He architected that lab. He tried to turn it into a big lab, but we, me and my partner, I met him through John, who had known him 10 years earlier. Uh, uh, we failed miserably. I mean, we printed a lot of people, and that collection is very nice, and it's at Harvard right now in, as an archive. But um, uh, we were terrible business people. I'm busy watching the Warhol documentary right now. He was like, you know, I was a business artist, and I thought, oh my God, like, what did Peter think of all? It's like, you know, what does that mean? Um, but it's true, he, uh, as a portrait artist, I'm also, I make portraits. Um, the stillness, as Nan said, in those portraits is unlike anybody else. It's extraordinary. But the way he influenced me, and, and there's a book that 
house for sale outside right now, the, the Linda Rosencrantz book that, uh, um, that just got published with uh, Jordan. Um, <clears throat> there's a little passage in it where he's photographing Helen Ginsburg and he describes why the portrait doesn't work. And he said, well, Allen Ginsberg never came to me. He never, he, never, he never let go of himself to, I'm not quoting him now, I'm kind of paraphrasing my own how I see things. And when I make portraits, it's a, a real trial because I'm intimate and I look at the result and I, see, I, I judge them in the same way. Did that person give themselves to me? Uh, and of course, I again, it affects my relationship with them from that point on. And it did with Allen Ginsberg and, and, and Peter. In fact, he, he's talking to Linda and he says, well, you know, this thing is for the New York Times. Maybe I can make it better. And that's the other way he really influenced me. He really believed that once you've made the photograph, you could then improve it in the darkroom or make it work in the darkroom. And that's what he taught me. Uh, he taught me the darkroom. In fact, he sent me to Liz Edmondel, thank you for mentioning her, to learn it in the same way he did, and he wanted me to learn from her, so that then he could, crib. He could actually, uh, <laughs> while I was looking at his prints, I could you know, tell him how she printed and, and how she was able to make uh, the negative function as a narrative, as a, you know, as a, like pushing and pulling and burning and dodging, bleaching, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, he's changed, he totally changed my life, yeah, uh, in many ways. Thank you. I would never claim to be Peter's best friend. <laughs> <laughs> because I knew there were so many others out there. Uh, but he certainly, he did, did also change my life in a lot of ways. When I met him, I was writing about music. Um, so I was interested in photography, I was interested in everything. But um, I, he taught me to look at things in a way that I hadn't before, just by looking at things with him. Looking at his work, paging through magazines with him, sitting and looking at Harper's Bazaar, looking at every book, because I was buying things when I couldn't afford to, and Peter just knew he couldn't. So he would come to my house and we would look at things. Um, and looking, noticing what he noticed made a huge impression on me. I saw what he picked out, what he stopped at, what he didn't find interesting. Um, and it really taught me to discern in a, in a way that was my own, but that I understood, you know, something that he, he made me understand that you could look in a, in a really educational and useful way. But also I was thinking about when I met him, it was early in my time in New York, and I, he also changed the way I thought gay men could be. Um, when I was in college, my, my two like gay mentors were both super campy, and I could never relate to that. It wasn't, that wasn't me. I didn't really understand that. Um, and so to spend time with Peter, who was like super masculine and big and tough in a lot of ways, and could get through pretty much anything, um, and was also gayer than anybody I knew, <laughs> and, you know, actively gayer than anyone I knew in my life, um, it was I realized that that was a way to be. That was a possible way to be that I hadn't even kind of grasped before. And that was not that I could be Peter uh, in any reasonable way, but at least I could come closer to something that was, that I could understand as another way to live. So, well, you, you already have your own mic. Yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, I have my own mic. Oh. <laughs> Gee, ah, oh, shucks. This works? Okay. Uh, I just want to add one or two remarks. First of all, about Schneider and Erdman Gallery. Miserable failure is not the word I would use. It did, while it existed, some of the most interesting and important photography, plenty of photography that was done anywhere in the country. 
the major photographers in this country, in this city, lined up to have a chance to have him print their work. It's absolutely true. And something that Vincent just said makes me want to make a comment, because um, I think it's important to say. When he was ill, I would come regularly, I have a notebook, and I would write down what he was telling me I was supposed to do when it happened. And one of the things he said to me about probably 500 times was, remember, I want to be remembered as a photographer who was gay, not as a gay photographer. Yes. And I listened to that and I thought, okay, I guess I get it. He wants to be remembered as Peter Hujar, not George Platt Lines. Okay, I'll bear that in mind. But in 35 years since Peter died, the world has changed in ways that he could probably not imagine. And I find it thrilling, not definitive of his whole work, but a thrilling factor in his work that he is part of a cutting edge in a change in the world's attitudes toward gayness and gay art, or art produced by gays, that he could not even have imagined was possible in 1987. Um, but it's been wonderful to watch it happen. Anyway, any, that's my comment for the moment. Do you have more questions? <laughs> what else would you oh, like oh, to oh, say? No. <laughs> um, no, no, no. Besides his influence on me, my work, with, uh, and also I was thinking, you know, in this day and age, when people scroll through Instagram, they don't know how to look anymore. People don't, people see in one half a second, literally. And there's just this constant digestion of imagery, superficial imagery, and I think it's so important to sit and look at Peter's work to understand what photographers and what measurements mean. As, you know, his work is out there now. People's, it's available, it's not so obscure. Uh, yeah. But also he taught me how to be in the world. He taught me never to compromise. And it was a really important lesson. He taught me that the hardest word for an artist to say was no, and that you had to learn that. The first shooting commercially I did was for Mademoiselle in the early 80s. And I never I was very nervous. So I bought all the Mademoiselles and tried to study how to be a Mademoiselle for that must have been the <laughs> And it didn't work. But I was um, I set up this table at Evelyn's. You remember Evelyn's? Oh, yeah. And I asked Peter to borrow his tripod, so he came and delivered it to Evelyn. He saw the setup I'd done. He said, you are an angle, and, and he smashed the whole table. <laughs> and he taught me never compromise on anything. We were supposed to have a show at Jay Gorney Gallery and together, and for some reason, I was even more difficult than Peter. <laughs> Everyone said Peter was so difficult, but you know, move over. <laughs> so when he dropped me while we were playing the show, he said Peter, Peter uh, dropped it. Uh, he refused to do the show. Uh, he had this deep loyalty, and I would like always to be like Peter in that way. I, I think Peter would be really distressed by the world now. I can keep you like I am. And my whole generation has gone to get old with. The best people die. Well, well, he was already distressed in his own time. That's true. <laughs> so, so, it's, like, it, it's, it's frightening to think how, how exponentially it could have grown in the, in the years since. Yeah, but if more of us had been alive, maybe things would have gone differently. Mm. Mm -hmm. We lost the whole generation. Yeah, yeah. And a whole audience. Not only of, yeah. of artists, but the audiences the audience for that artist. Yeah. And the real estate of the artists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I need to address I need to address something you you, you said about the lab. Um, <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> no, I was very proud of my work, and actually, it was all these you should have been different different yeah. artists, right? And we would have a, you know, we had a, a we, we exhibited, we exhibited the printer's proofs in the lab. It was quite a, you know, to show the range. Like I was always printing their work rather than uh, being the author of any part of it. And uh, the, the great thing that Peter taught me was um, like how to like to be addressed this 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 thing of who the artist is, what their you know what their idea was inside of the photograph, and then to wrestle with the negative in order to bring that idea to them. Uh, and so it was always a performance. It was always a performance on my part. And I think he sent me to Lisette also because she printed in, I think I might have said that already, she printed in the same way he did. And when I was looking through prints with him, because we always did that, right? We would look through the whole range of prints. He kind of wanted me to be that other voice uh, and I, I use John for this now uh, with my own work and with when I'm printing Peter's work to like say, well, you know, what the, between these two prints, like, you know, what is happening? Uh, like, why did you push that figure back more and bring this one more forward? And why did you make that area more black and make this one more gray or more muddy in order to, you know, um, so, yeah, he always wanted me to talk about those aspects of the work, of his printing. And like we were looking through, I was at the, at the, uh, at the uh, archive uh, last, uh, two weeks ago, looking through all the prints, and uh, it, it, it really brought back that experience of going through his prints with him uh, when he was putting together the Gracie show, or when he was, you know, when I was there to select the print because I did processing for him, and then I'd come in and he'd give me prints. So, um, I don't know, does that make that clearer? I'm very proud of the work that I did at the lab. And I believe it, that when I did at the lab. And if you want to see. He cared so much about printing. He really cared a lot about printing. And, and he did, he actually did, he really loved that early body of work of yours. And he said to me, someday, man might come to you <laughs> to print that work, and you should absolutely encourage it. And we did, actually. He and, yeah. yeah, he did, actually, you know, before, I mean, it was much later, it was a few years later. Yeah. And then I used all the paper that I inherited from Louise yeah. Starwolf to print your to print oh, your show, yeah. Yeah. Well, she died and she, uh, his, her sister left me all the portrait. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that beautiful. Oh, God. Well, that was Peter's paper as well. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, he, he, he had me print for him in the last year of his life. And so I think he was kind of training me all the way along. It was yeah. only really, you know, 10 years of training, but, yeah, to, uh, to be able to do that, yeah. Uh, I want to talk about uh, being photographed by Peter. I never had the opportunity. We talked about it many times, and it's one of my great regrets. But I was living with Greer Langton when she was photographed, and I was cl close to Cookie Mueller when she was photographed. And Greer was really nervous, and she went and spent a few hours, and she came back totally intoxicated. <laughs> with that drugs. He, he had completely seduced her and he brought her to this point of total relaxation and comfort in her body that was extraordinary and cookie the same she had an incredible experience with peter so i think that shows in the work how empathetic and deeply connected he was to his subject my theory now is that we're all in solitude confinement in our heads and i think peter felt that very much and I think Peter was able to open the bars of other people's cages or inside prisons for a minute at least. And uh, because there's nobody who connected as deeply with his people in a silent way. And uh, I think people need to really look at anybody who hasn't looked at his work. Yeah, I, I'd like to talk toward that too because. Um, Peter did photograph me once for Portraits of Life and Death, which I'm really glad exists at my knee at that point. Um, 
but I don't remember the occasion at all. I don't remember the experience. Um, I don't. You know, I have the worst memory in the world, and this is one of the things. I'm sorry, I never went back and took notes on immediately uh, because I've been asked about it so many times. But what I what I think about is, at one point I asked him to photograph a boyfriend of mine, Manny, uh, who I was really kind of obsessed with, and but who was really a kind of withdrawn, quiet guy, uh, and didn't communicate easily. He'd met Peter, you know, casually with me at some point. Um, and he wanted to be a boxer um, uh, at that, that moment in his life. Uh, and so I asked Peter to photograph him. And I really wondered always what that experience was like for both of them. Because Peter produced, I think, five prints from that session. Um, and, um, and they all were so open. I mean, here was Manny, who I always felt was like super close up and, and kind of difficult. Um, and he clearly, they related on some level, I suspect on some level of both being damaged in a similar way that they didn't need to talk about, but that they saw in each other. And, um, and the pictures were really extraordinary. Um, and he also wondered, like, how did he get Manny naked? He did fairly, he did fairly quickly. Um, but uh, I think it started because Manny decided he was going to be in his boxing shorts. So he was already close. Um, and, and Manny, again, somebody who generally seemed like super closed down, looked so relaxed. And it had to do with that relationship with Peter you know, being open to him and vice versa. So that was kind of revelatory to me. Uh, it, it, I didn't feel like Peter got anything of that with me, but I, that's okay. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> I don't remember. That. <laughs> Maybe you did. No, I don't <laughs> well, the, the odd thing was I recently got to see the contact sheets of a lot of other shoots that Peter did with me, some just on the street, but I had forgotten that he also photographed me before this Portraits in Life and Death image in my old apartment. Um, and I saw, you know, like five contact sheets of that material, and I immediately understood why I never saw them again, why he never used anything from them. They were really not interesting. And, and he knew that, and I, and I never saw the results, so it wasn't until seeing it now that I kind of got what didn't work that time. Who knows why? Um, I just want to add one thing. There's a lot of things I would like to add, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to say one thing about this business of everybody being his best friend. He had a capacity for intimacy which was unique in my experience. I, it's not just that you could go and tell him all your troubles and go on and on and talk about your sex fantasies and how things were going. No. He could talk about anything and he would hear you better than anybody heard you. And it was a, a wonderful experience. It was very much one-on-one. -on -one. The Peter the Great Listener turned into Peter the Charmer or the Enraged but also the charmer when there were a couple of other people around. And that was very interesting. But that one-on-one -on -one experience with him in conversation, as with when he was photographing, was a very profound and valuable one. And I will never get over not being able to have it anymore. I would say another thing. Peter knew, quote, everybody. He, he knew, he was acquainted with everybody. He connected to unbelievable numbers of people. And yet he was, in some essential way, that I don't mean to get sentimental about, a very isolated person, very on his own. And I'll give you one example of this as an anecdote that may help. He went to one of the advanced high schools 
uh, I always get its name wrong, but it was uh, it was not music and art, but it was one for very gifted people who were going to work in fields other than high art of one sort, and photography was considered one of them. Comic book making was there. Tony Bennett was a graduate of it, and um, um, and Calvin Klein was a graduate of this high school, and. So was Peter. He was there given enormous direction and help by his English teacher, a remarkable woman named Daisy Alden, who helped. Thank you. I, I'm glad to hear that. She was a, a very special force. And, but this is what happened when he graduated from the high school. They were all on the platform in their caps and gowns with the, you know, the little tassels and all the stuff. And the stack of diplomas were being handed out. And the names would be called, and the kid would come up, get the diploma, and his family would applaud, and everyone else would sort of applaud too. And then they called Peter Hugh Charm. And he wasn't there. No one came up. And then they called him again. And from the very back row of the auditorium, one person started to clump, slowly, which was Peter himself. <laughs> now I leave you, I don't know what that image means, but it means something, it really does. Okay. Um, well, I think that's incredibly precocious for uh, oh. high school <laughs> graduation performance. Uh, one of the best stories I've ever heard um, about the graduation. Um, but I was just going to say, something that you said before that made me think about, like not, not having known Peter, I, I never met him, um, but I, I read a lot about him, and I always had this impression that he was uh, a very feral person, uh, and that also that he kind of lived, lived on the edge of poverty and um, sure. yeah. but then so actually in preparation for, for today I reread the um, Peter Hujara's Day book um, that was just published by, by Magic Hour and and I was actually really struck this time by like you said just how many people this guy knew like how many people how many names he mentions and what he knows about all these people, and um, and also just like the kind of like, like almost a novelistic sensibility that he has, and in, in his storytelling, in his recounting of one day, like it's uh, it's it's really it's really quite um, you know phenomenal. It's like it's it's like he's really like like a nineteenth century novelist, like in terms of like all of the details that he. He remembers and he recounts and maybe he's em embellishing, but it doesn't even sound like he's he's doing that. Um, you know, he has like a character appear in one scene and then reappear reappear a little later in another scene. Like all these kind of like devices of uh, of storytelling are just there in his casual, you know, without notes apparently oh, re oh. recounting of, of his day. Well, also you know. One of the things that struck me about that book, too, were the pictures of his apartment, which I don't remember ever looking like that. Unbelievably but, glamorous. Yeah, like two pianos and those sort of, you know, so chairs, all this, like, it looks so fancy. I mean, I, I mean, beyond, even if all those things didn't last in his apartment for very long, that was a great loft in, in a great space, beautiful windows. I mean. If he was living in poverty, he was living really well. <laughs> so he, you know, it's like likely he landed at least in a really terrific place. He built his own dark room. If he needed nothing else, it was there, uh, and nothing was expensive at that moment. Even though none of us had a lot of money. And, um, I would. Uh, I, Peter was certainly the poorest very serious grown-up I've ever been close to. And I knew it. And at the same time, 
it was impossible to think of him as poor. He didn't seem poor at all. Um, he, many people I've discovered use the word to describe him aristocratic. And it's quite, it is not ridiculous, although from me, but he, he liked the Queen. We used to talk about her quite a lot. <laughs> he, he wished he could photograph her, but it was not crazy to think of him sitting and talking at a polo match with the Duke of Edinburgh. <laughs> he sort of looked like it would fit in fine. Um, so it, it's uh, absolutely true. I, I, I knew, don't suggest you go out to a restaurant. Why? Because he won't let you pay for him and he can't afford to pay. Therefore, do something else. And, I don't remember that. Oh, I, I used to I used to do it, and that's why I cooked for him all the time. People yeah, like, especially, I mean, the, you know, in Peter Hujar's day, I paid for that Chinese dinner. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that $7.95 Chinese dinner. <laughs> Buy you the coke, so. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing about Peter is he did, he did not stint on his on, on printing. No, no. He left a huge number of prints, and that paper was not inexpensive. Ah, uh -huh, but I can tell you something. Oh. <laughs> Peter would check out all the venues that sold the paper. And he would learn exactly, not part, not part, not approximately, the day that the paper would become obsolete. So it would drop to half price. You mean outdated? Uh, outdated, not only obsolete, outdated. And he knew perfectly well that it was still great paper, there was no problem. And he would arrive at opening of the store that day <laughs> to buy half-price paper. Uh, I, I think it's interesting to talk about why Peter never got successful. Like, in the bigger world, a critic once wrote that Maplethorpe had the success that Peter Hujar should have had. And it was true. Uh, he, he won compromise. I think that was the bottom line. That was it. The real problem, actually, is if you were alive today, I think you would be very impressed with the exhibitions that just happened, right? Like this traveling show. Mm -hmm. Like he would have given those curators really a tough time. Yeah. Oh, and so yeah. maybe there would have been half the number of venues. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. He was so tough. He was just so tough. But he wouldn't yeah. compromise that. No, no, he wasn't. He was going to compromise nothing. I mean, you know, obviously that no compromise was a good thing on some level. It's, it allowed him to keep doing great work, but it did keep him from being successful and famous in his own time. But right. he was famous in our world. In our world, oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, about this business, I mean, it was very difficult for me to come to realize that Peter, first of all, would not compromise, but he had a thing about success that was deep and troubled, and I never fully understood it. That he was also craved it, wanted it very much, and also it wasn't possible for him. I remember an occasion which made a change my whole life. He was having dinner with me, and he was explaining why he wasn't going to do some suggestion that to do something to show in some place. Or and I thought the argument of why he wasn't going to do it was not very persuasive. And I got a little miff, and I said, Peter, if I had another life, I know I could make you successful. I know I could make you known if I were in charge of doing it. Well, you have. And, <laughs> but, and, I, and I was thinking, oh, what a nice idea. I could be Peter's manager. And then I thought, do you want to commit suicide? 
because if I had tried to take over Peter's work, I would have been dead within 10 days. He would have killed me. <laughs> it's just that simple. So it, it was, I knew, even then, I didn't say, how would you like me to be your manager? I wasn't that dumb. But it was, it was really true. He, he was going to be himself no matter what it meant. Well, you know, I think a lot of us felt like we wish we could do this for Peter. Yes. Wish we could find someone to be the ideal dealer, that the person to take his hand so he wouldn't have to deal with all this stuff. I mean, I remember his horror of studio visits, that they were just like the worst thing in the world for him. It just was so difficult. It would just be, you know, he couldn't handle that. Absolutely. And, and I kept saying, you need someone just to do it for you. You don't need to be there. You need someone just to take it and show it. Um, of course, that never happened. But that I kept thinking there had to be some way to, to prevent him from, you know, making things difficult for himself and for allowing the work to get out into the world. I actually have a, a question that maybe um, you guys can answer. So. Um, uh, I, I don't think he ever published, and he never wrote about his own work. There was nothing published, and he was uh, interviewed. And he was, yeah, and this interview came out. Um, well, I, it, Jordan published it very recently, um, but I went, and I know that there was a time where he was invited to give a talk. I think at a, at a university upstate, and he got there and he froze. He couldn't. Speak. I read about that in maybe in the Morgan yeah. Library yeah. Yeah. book. Yeah. Um, but I was wondering, did he talk about his work? Like, did, did like constantly? <laughs> how how did he? he was a I mean, he really thought he was. How he did he brilliant. talk about? It? He he really um, he really knew that his work was great. He actually did. He, knew that. he really knew that. And he knew exactly how to talk about it. And those were most of our conversations, actually. He, 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 could, you know, he, he, he would never have used the word great that I now feel free to use about it. But I can tell you that, for example, he would leave various kinds of prints in the box, not because he thought they were all great, but he said, after I'm gone, scholars will want to know how I reached to his own. There's no question he believed and, that, yeah. And he believed that he would be famous after he died. That was his mantra. He believed it, and he was right, of course. One thing that I found out from working with uh, somebody, Francis, who also works with the archive, the Peter Hujar archive, is that nothing is allowed to be printed that he didn't print in his lifetime? Correct. Wow. That is such a precise legacy. So much important. respect for that. So I, much respect. I made one exception. Uh, there was, when he did the catacombs, he did a snap of Paul. When he did the catacombs in Palermo, Paul Tech was with him, and he turned around and did a snap of Paul standing near the corpses. And I thought, this, he never printed it. And I thought, this one is really interesting. And so I will put it as, out as an historical document. It's not a theater music. You're allowed allow to be reproduced, right? You allow I allow it to be re reproduced, and it's not quite widely known. But it is not a picture that Peter regarded as part of his work. He was actually a really great editor. Yes. Well, I mean, Vince was talking about all those contact sheets. Of, you know, that's the great thing that Francis has been sort of, in a way, cataloging, um, or cataloged. Or, uh, so, we were shown all the contact sheets of the two of us, like, you know, all that, and they were terrible <laughs> sessions. I mean, there were some sessions that he wouldn't have gone near. Do you know what I mean? He, they literally were failures. They were failure sessions, yeah. I, I discovered like from the seeing some of, some of the archive that he overexposed, that they're very flat negatives. Very flat. They, very, very detailed negatives. But yes. very flat. Yes. And then he printed darks. Yes, yes. yes. Wow. And then he started, he started from 
a huge amount of information in the negative and then began to discard in order to edit the image, uh, to frame the image, right? So he would get rid of information in the shadows, like make them graphic blacks often in order to, you know, in order to enhance the meaning of, like when he talks about in the book that Allen Ginsberg photo, which, you know, he was really wrong, he must have done a huge amount of work on it, like pulling, like even like bleaching, like a, you know, an eye or a cheek, or I don't know what he did. It's still a boring picture. Hmm? And it's still a boring picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was probably got reproduced, right? It probably got used. Yeah. yeah. But there was no Photoshop then. I want people to know. <laughs> All of this was done with integrity. Oh. Um, <laughs> 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 That's another conversation. <laughs> we've, been, we've been going. I want to talk about his animals, though. Okay, talk about his animals. I have to say that's what I'm looking at the most right now. Nobody has ever photographed animals like that. And from what I understand of his bio biography, and I didn't know, was that he grew up on a farm, I knew that, but the first creatures he must have had communion with were animals. That's correct. And none of his animals are species, they're specific, they're individuals, and they have such trust, and he gets as close to them as he gets to any person. And he actually speaks with them and deeply. I've never seen it. It's just... that, that picture right there. Yeah, that's a beautiful. He told me that it, he was based it on Cecil Beaton's portrait of the Queen Mother. <laughs> <laughs> I remember once he visited me. I was away from the summer vacation. And he visited me in the country, and we would go out for drives, and it was great. And one of the things that happened very typically with Peter, we'd be driving along, and as usual, I would be talking. <laughs> and uh, he'd say, stop. I'd stop the car. He'd say, wait here a minute. <laughs> and we would then climb over a barbed wire fence and go out a bunch, to a bunch of cows. And I would wait, and one minute became five minutes, became 10 minutes, became 15 minutes. Finally, after half an hour, I thought, maybe I'd better go back. Something bad may have happened. I mean, I'll go. And he uh, would walk in. I walked up to him, and he was talking to the cows. He was having long, elaborate conversations with them saying, you know, you feel this way, but I know you don't like that one. That's, you know, and there would be a whole discussion going on. And, it, and he was not glad that I'd come to find him. I had to go and sit aside for another hour while he talked to the cast. But they talked back. And they talked back, yeah. 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 I, mean, I mean, you should talk at this. I mean, your book has so much of, of the animal photos in it. You know, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I could, I could say a few words. Um, uh, yeah, I think his his um, animal portraits kind of in, uh, influenced me for a very long time on a, I don't know, maybe more of a subliminal level. Um, I, I I had dogs for a long time, and I and I photographed them, and I think I always had um, Peter Bajar at, at the back of my mind, even if I didn't know it. Um, the first dog, at least, um, and then um, I, um, you know, I was invited to do this this show to you know to curate a show of, of Hujar's work with my own at, at Gallery Buchholz in Berlin, and subsequently this book um, uh, came out of it, and I. Um, I was re like you know, I was really thinking about the animal portraits because I've been spending a lot of time with horses lately, and and so I was like you know, unlike maybe the unconscious way I was thinking about photographing the dogs, you know, decades before, with these, I was for the show, I was trying to come up with some really good horse photographs and. Um, it was, uh, and I, I say this in the book, I wrote some notes at the back, but 
you know, I, I've, I've, all, I've long, you know, admired Hujar's, you know, ability to get, to get um, really extraordinary animal photos. And it was only when I tried to do it myself that I realized how unbelievably hard it is, like, especially with horses, because they don't stand still. They're, you know, shaking off flies with their manes and tails, or they're eating. They, they'll never... Uh, cows as well, but they're just they're eating all the time. And that, it's not an interesting portrait with the head down eating. There's no eating in his animals. No, there's, there's no eating. That's so interesting. And I'll, I'll just tell one, I'll tell one little anecdote. Okay, so I was using the wrong shutter speed for, for my photographs of horses. And they're covered in flies. And so even though some of my frames had the horse not blurred, the flies were blurred all over the face of the horse. I didn't say nice. I, I, said, I thought failure to no, myself. Um, but here's something that I discovered recently. I went to visit Gary, and he told me about printing maybe the most famous Huchar horse photo. Um, horse in the West Virginia mountain. And Gary discovered a fly on the... Um, the rump of the horse, perfectly sharp and in focus. But Peter had printed it. He had printed it down so that you couldn't see it. I would have died for that, you know, perfectly sharp, still in focus. If you weren't at the printing it down, what he would have done is he would have spotted it out. He would have actually retouched it out. He would have left it in. Because the, the, the print that he gave, the print that he gave to John for his thirtieth has it in. Okay. Yeah, the flies are there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, we he were got death a lot, and I think to me he's, there was no morbidity in it. He just it was accepted. It was like the way he photographed anything. It's there. He connects to it. And one of my very favorite pictures is a seagull. On the sand, whose head is up as if he's crying. Mm. It's all about mortality. It's really touching. Mm. Yeah, and something's out of focus in it. It's like one of the only pictures that has a background that's out of focus. It's an extraordinary picture. Uh, I am afraid that there's a problem with time. At this point, there, Peter was never somebody who wished much to be a filmmaker that I know of, at least he never discussed it with me, uh, much as he loved movies. But he did make a brief film of Ethel, which we now can show here. No, no, that is what I'm talking about, Peter. There's another one that was made by Peter, which we can see now. After which, since I think this is a very, very live wire audience, I think we should have a few in it. So let's take a look at the Thank <laughs> you. 
That is, that is, that, no, no, it was, it was not Queen Elizabeth II, it was Queen Elizabeth I, who was impersonated by Ethel and did a performance. An area at those days would give parties prior to the hour some people were supposed to arrive as a way of priming the pump. And they would give you a party if they thought you would have a lot of people come. And it happened. And it was a, it was a, Peter absolutely loved it. And uh, it, was a, it was a great occasion for him at his 50th birthday. He lived for three more years after that. Really close friends. You know, they were, they were incredible. Maybe, maybe that, maybe Ethel was really his best friend. <laughs> <laughs> they were really close. Yeah, it, it, it's absolutely well, David, yeah, of course, David was a whole lot. Yeah, David, but when David came along, I knew I was no longer his best friend. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's not a question, huh? Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. Could have, that could happen. Oh yeah. Um, but but talking about you know you talk about Peter not being known. They were. That, that party was very crowded, and then when he had his opening party after Gracie's opening, and of course he, he never beat up on Gracie actually, that was the one exhibition where he was really happy and, and so on. You want to know why? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the situation with Gracie went beautifully because it was entirely stage managed by David. Oh, that's true. Oh. I mean, David learned to us a thought that Peter didn't have a demon and went to Gracie and said, you've got to do a show, Peter Dutra, and she took her about three minutes to say, yes, let's do it. Mm -hmm. And, but after that, David was present for all, everything, and he well, was I diplomatic know. in a way that Peter well, was not always. Gracie, Gracie. Where is this? I can't say, I can't say. Gracie, stand up. Stand up. Yeah. <laughs> And, and, I, uh, am, am I accurate? Am I no, wrong? I mean, I'm going to turn this over to Sir because Sir worked with Peter. Okay, well, let's hear the story. To do the installation. But I do want to say one thing. When I hear all these stories about how difficult Peter was, Peter participated in some of the most crazy shows that I came up with, like a, a portrait show where if you agreed to be in this show, you agreed to take portraits of anybody that. And, and, that anybody would come and ask any of the artists for a portrait, you would have to agree to do it. And there was like a set price. And of course, nobody took any of the artists up on it. It's just, I thought it was a brilliant idea. But, you know. And Peter agreed to that and to the famous show. And he, I mean, he, like you said, he was, he was, my experience with him was, was wonderful. But Sir really worked with him to do the installation. No, my, my experience with Peter is that he came, he had this idea for doing a show. And he wanted to show 100 photographs, I think that was it, 100 prints. And he had a very specific way about how he wanted the work hung. And I think Gracie and I just stepped back and said, <laughs> lay it out the way that you want it to be laid out. And for the only time, that was the only show that I didn't install. Right. We got these super high-end installers who, because he had his stuff cut in Mac, so just sheets of glass on it, to install the work exactly to his specifications. So we just said yes to everything that he wanted. And he had it look exactly the way that he wanted to look, and we were fine with it. And he was very happy. He used to sit in the oak room and talk to me. He was incredibly generous. He gave me uh, that photograph of the girl with the ball. That's Chloe become, Finch. Chloe Finch. That's really cool. Just as a gift. We used to sit there and talk for hours. and. Uh, no, he was very nice, not difficult at all. We heard that he was selling prints out of the studio during the show, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but well, I, I remember asking you if David showed up to help him do it, and you said no, right? No. no well, David, in that case, I'm misinformed, and I take it back. I'm sorry. David but, introduced him, said, yeah, David, David came in and said, you have to do the, you, should, you, need, you need to do a show with Peter Rejar. And of course, we agreed to do it. Okay, because yeah. David said that it should be important, and we were, I was a little bit afraid of, of Peter Bouchard for years, 
because I was a roommate with Jackie Curtis for a while. And she had told me that Peter Bouchard stole her loft and wouldn't get back to her. So I believe that, I believe that Peter Bouchard was like this person to keep away from because he was this awful person. And this is like in the 70s. And then, you know, when he came to the gallery, it was like, oh, this is this awful person, but I guess, you know, it's kind of okay. And he was the sweetest person. It's really, you know, Stephen, Stephen was right in one thing. You were correct to say that because this, you know, Gracie was David's gallery, right? And right. so that was a huge deal for him to because he had he was so in love with David right. and so trusting of him. They were like, you know, father, son, or brothers, yeah. or whatever. They were family, really family. Yeah, that's so, amazing. Oh, yeah. One, and and so he would have trusted you because David trusted you. But. Well, let me just uh, ask Sir something, because my my memory of this was that Peter moved those things around a zillion times before he came to oh, the Oh, right. right. that sounds right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's very, very particular, and I remember him commenting on the photograph of the animals. He liked he, he didn't like things to be grouped together. He liked there to be like a lot of difference. So he really focused on the photograph, but he always he told me that he thought the cow portraits were were like self portraits. Because he thought he looked like the cows. <laughs> he had a, 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 a. There's a whole weird part of Peter that you just opened up. <laughs> <laughs> Which I don't. I want to ruin the whole question, here, because I could tell you a lot about it. It was Peter was one of the best looking people of his generation. Okay. He was fantastically good looking. He believed because his mother had told him that he was homeland. He used to sometimes get on a bus and look for as remote a seat on the bus as he could find so no one would have to look at him. It's appalling. It's an absolutely horrible fact. Um, but and and it was one of those things, nothing would change his mind about that. No matter how, everyone I intro introduced to him, was immediately in love with him. Right. That didn't change anything about how we felt about himself. That's right. It, it was bizarre. I, I mean, Linda Rosenkrantz used to say, Peter Hughes are the really good looking Anthony Perkins. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it, but it's very interesting that that was, that was true. Other thing I would have to add as part of the magic of the great love that happened between Peter and David is that uh, okay, but that one of the great love is that he they were both of them at heart rageaholics. They were sitting on fury, horrible fury in both of them except with each other. There, it was peace. And it's one of the most remarkable facts that these two rageaholics were so bound together in such a beautiful way. And, Any more questions? questions? Yeah, uh, I want to thank the panel. Let's turn it around. I'm sitting over here. See you. Can you see me, Stephen? I, uh, I, I, I hear a voice. Oh, yes, of course. Okay. I want to thank the panelists for bringing Peter into the room about how it affected each of you. I was very moved and touched by that. But what you're hearing is so, there's so many levels of Peter, and it's like his photo sessions. I just want to talk, as someone who lived with him, I have, I have another level of understanding of Peter, which is not important to talk about at this moment, but in his work. He would sit with you for hours and hours and hours until all the masks that we all bring in to a photo session, until he got you to that naked, not so much physically, but it could be emotional, psychic place. And that was his genius. He would eat with you, he'd have sex with you, whatever it needed to have to get to that moment, and that's what's in those photographs that you see. It's just not silence. It's a very loud human element that we all hide to survive. 
I just wanted to also say about the, probably the best known in the public view of these images is the Gay Liberation Front poster. And it's been misused by the archive, but it's been stripped of how Peter did that photograph. It's untypical of any other work that he's done. Which uh, picture? The, the Gay Liberation Front poster, which is people running in the street. Well, it's, it's, as someone who set it up with him, it's my boyfriend at the time, uh, it was for the Gay Liberation Front, and it says, come out, join the sisters and brothers of the Gay Liberation Front. And he did that, it's not typical of any of his other work. And it's, uh, in, in talking about it, in stripping all of the meaning of why he did it, I think it's a, a, a chandra. Um, and I think that you also, need to know that this incredibly creative, sensitive, handsome man, like many gay men, was deeply, deeply damaged by his mother. And that he carried with him all his life. There's many more stories that could be told about Peter. If I had one more person call me and say, you know, I had sex with Peter and blah, blah, blah. And I said, why are you telling me this? I know we had sex with everybody here. But I have love letters from him that talks about how he struggles with that. And um, that side of Peter is the personal. That's the side that downtown meant to Peter. Jackie's grandmother was very much involved in that loss situation. You know, and, and Jackie liked to be high drama, but Jackie loved Peter. We took a series of photos of, of Jackie for the cover of a magazine that I was the editor of, in which you saw the male and you saw Jackie's fantasy of himself as, as the female Jackie. And <clears throat> the publishers refused to print them because they, they wound up, it was about the new sexuality, they wanted to have a cover with two. Uh, two Girls and a boy. But those, I think, are in the archives, and I hope that people have a chance to look at those photographs because you really see who Jackie actually was. Uh, we got time for maybe one or two more questions, and then there's a reception out in the lobby. Oh, I don't know. I just had a, just to return to the the Gracie Mansion show and the animal photographs. I was curious how he talked about the animal photographs in relation to the portraits. We've mentioned portraits and life and death and the sequencing of that. And you know, the show at Gracie Mansion had such a different type of sequencing than he was doing in his earlier, the earlier stages of his career. And um, it brought in the animal photographs. And I was curious if you all could speak to how he discussed those photographs with you all. Crazy. Oh, discuss the animal photographs? Well, yeah. I mean, the animal photographs were portraits, as were. Yeah. But then there was also like the, tra the photographs of trash and other the, the landscapes and bringing well, all that together. Jersey, when you go to these portraits in New Jersey. Yeah, I can, I can, I can, I sort of helped him select, but I was with him selecting that show. Oh, well, yeah. there, so you're the one. So you're <laughs> the, the one. Time for it? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, what he really wanted to do with that show was give every, and actually Sir said it, he, he wanted every photograph, whatever it was, if it was a bush or, um, you know, a burnt out trash or a burnt out, like this, you know, uh, a room on the pier or uh, a portrait or a drag queen, he wanted every single image to have equal space or equal place. So we installed the show juxtaposing opposites or juxtaposing contrasts. And so, and, and I, maybe it was Gracie that said, you could see, like when you see shows that are hung salon style and very close together, it's really difficult to pull out an image, you know, one particular, with that show, it was extraordinarily, it was, it was truly successful because you could see every single photograph as you looked at it, right. without being inter interrupted by the others, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. And, I mean, it's, it's also because he brought the same level of technique and, 
um, seeing and um, you know just like photographic genius to every everything that he photographed. But I like your point about how portraits and life and death is, is really distinctive and that it goes against this other model. I mean, he only did one book in his lifetime, but it does really go against the other model of mixing up the genres. Time for one more question, I think, before the reception. Um, thank you for this conversation, which has been really enlightening. Uh, and one of the things that I'm most interested in is the friendships that you barely, we, you know, we've been a tip of the iceberg to understand what the man and the friendship was for all of you. I'm wondering uh, what it's been like to have your friend become a public figure since his death and how that affected you as someone who had such a private experience with him um, during his life. Um. I always knew, I, as I said in the beginning, I didn't truly understand Peter's work for several years before I really, the scales fell from my eyes and I really, really saw it. But from the jump, and certainly from long before he died, I knew that he was destined to be known that if he weren't going to be known, something terrible and very inappropriate would have happened. Um, it's like he was always famous. You never thought he was poor, and he was always famous. Um, it, that's the way it felt. And I, I never doubted when I got the job of essentially bringing him out of quote, obscurity, into high visibility. I never doubted for a moment that that's what should be done. That was perfectly clear. Actually, I find this uh, conversation wonderful but very upsetting. It really, it really makes me miss Ethel, but more Peter. And, um, and to your question, I'm kind of used to it. I've watched a lot of people who passed become Cookie Mueller, David Wonorovich, become more and more public figures. And I think it's amazing and wonderful and gratifying. I just hope that people, I mean, I, I have so many lectures to the new generations <laughs> as an older, and uh, I just want people to really look at Peter's work and not think about what was the 80s in New York looked like, and not the surfaces. I want people to really take the time to look at Peter's work. I, I really don't have much to add to what Nan said, because it is incredibly gratifying to know someone who struggled at his own time, who you knew needed to be better known and deserved to be better known. And just, you know, to watch him kind of um, pull together a life month by month and how difficult that was for him. Um, and regret that he's not around to benefit from this. Uh, but again, know that he would have made it difficult for anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Sadly. Yeah. What is kind of extraordinary about it is this is a really new audience for him, right? Mm. You know, I mean, this is not an audience that knew him mostly. Right. Uh, uh, his audience was very dedicated and but sort of somewhat small, right? Right. Uh, during his lifetime. Absolutely. And when I spoke, began this discussion by saying that when I knew when I got the job and when I knew Peter before he died, I always thought, well, he's a remarkable photographer, but it's hard, it's very difficult. People can't see the beauty in it, it's difficult. It's gonna be a hard sell, it's, 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 I understand. And one of the real changes is in the generations, which is I see now people who were born after Peter died they all get it right away. They see it right away. 
if there wasn't that obstacle. I was not the only Dunkoff, you know, that thought this is difficult work. A lot of people thought it was. But not Avedon. Avedon was his first collector. Absolutely. He, and Avedon saw in Peter the potential of his work. When he and Arbus were in the master class with Avedon, and Avedon kept buying photos to keep him with food, but because he treasured the work. From the very beginning, the people that mattered to Peter understood. Absolutely. That's true. He was, it was an amazing that Avedon senior levels of art as a photographer, the photography as art in this country. He was at the senior levels of art as photography, as photography as art in this country, he was recognized right away. They all knew it. It was the rest of the machinery of publicity that he couldn't reach. Well, I think it's also the fact that photography is seen in a very different way over these past years. Absolutely. That it wasn't it didn't have the respect or the place in the larger art world that it now has. Um, it still was a kind of lesser. Oh, yeah. Um, Much so lesser. I think that has a lot to do with all uh, kind of reevaluations of, of various reputations, including Peter. He used to say, blow it up and they'll call it art. All right. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So please join us at the lab.